This video presentation covers slides 91 through 102 of chapter 1. The topics include a little more review on how we represent organic molecules, specifically contrasting condensed molecular formulas, line angle formulas, and wedge and dash formulas. This will be followed by a practice problem on hybridization. And then I'm going to give an introduction to isomers. Note that all of these topics will be covered in more details in later chapters. However, it is always good to introduce things early and often. Lewis structures are great, but they can be very clumsy for general use. There's just so much drawing that you have to do to draw an organic molecule. As such, we often utilize other methods to draw organic molecule. One methodology that is common out there is the condensed structural formula where we emphasize the carbon-carbon and carbon-heteroatom bonds. Heteroatom meaning things like oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur and things that are not carbon or hydrogen. In this condensed structural formula, most of the carbon-hydrogen bonds and the lone pairs are not shown. For example, if I look over here to the right at the t second structure drawn here, notice that I put all the carbons in order that they appear. I put the hydrogens near the carbons, but I don't draw any bonds between anything. Okay? A second way to represent that is when I get near the, the heteroatoms, I do actually sometimes emphasize the difference and how they're bonded. So I could either represent this end group here as COOH, or I could represent it as C single bond OH and C double bond O. Even this methodology is too cumbersome for organic chemists, so we simplify it again. We only depict the carbon skeleton and the heteroatoms. We call these line angle drawings or skeletal drawings here. So if I look at this drawing over here, I only represent the carbons by lines and where they sort of form an angle. And then I typically draw out the carbon hetero bonds here, or I can even leave out all the carbons here. So this carbon right out here has three hydrogens on it that are not drawn because I need four bonds to all my hydrogen carbons. Here's a carbon, I have two hydrogens on it. Here's a carbon, I have two hydrogens on it that are implicit, they're not drawn. If I want to even get simpler here, I could draw in this last carbon or not, depending on how I represent the heteroatoms here. So this is very typical. This is the typical shorthand that we're going to use for all of organic chemistry. Occasionally we'll go back to these other drawings here. Most atoms are not labeled by their atomic symbol and functional groups often have shorthand labels like the COOH here. So, so let's look at some examples. Let's look at hexane. The condensed structural formula shows one, two, three, four, five, six carbons sort of all in a row. It's still hard to get a feel for what it looks like in three dimensions, but if I do the line angle drawing, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Again, remembering that this N carbon here has three hydrogens that are implicit and they're not drawn. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, and three hydrogens. If I look at 2-hexene, where I have a double bond now between carbon number 2 and carbon number 3, again, this is the condensed structural formula. If I draw the line angle, I have 1 carbon, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons. I have 3 hydrogens out here. I already have 3 bonds, so I only have 1 hydrogen here and 1 hydrogen here that's implicit and not shown. 2 hydrogens two hydrogens, and two hydrogens. If I look at three hexanol, which is an alcohol, I can draw that out where my hydroxyl group, the alcohol group on there, is at carbon number three. If I draw it in line angle, it looks a little bit easier to visualize where that oxygen is. It's on one, two, it's on the third carbon. If I look at two methyl cyclohexanol, I have six carbons in a ring now. 
I have a hydroxyl group or an alcohol group on this carbon, and I have a methyl group or just a single carbon on that carbon. If I look at the line angle formula, sometimes I will represent the CH2 group out there as literally drawing out sort of a mini condensed structural formula, or I could just draw the line out there representing a CH3 sticking out there and a hydroxyl group sticking out there. For 2-cyclohexenone, I have a double bond and I have a double bond to oxygen. In the line angle formula, it looks a lot simpler. It's easier to see the carbon structure in that molecule. Again, I have zero hydrogens there because I already have four bonds. I have one hydrogen, one hydrogen, two, two, and two that are not shown. If I look at ninotinic acid or niacin, a biochemical, and I look at its condensed structural formula, it's starting to get complicated, okay? If I draw the line angle formula, I can simplify that a lot. I can easily see the double bonds. I sometimes throw in the lone pair of electrons and nitrogen too because they're special out here. So those are comparisons. Let's do some other comparisons. Here's three different organic molecules drawn out in the Lewis structure. I can simplify those a little bit if I go to the condensed structural formula. I start eliminating some of the carbon-hydrogen bonds, and then I sort of gets less sort of clustered in each of these. So it's a little bit easier to sort of visualize. But once I start doing line angle, it's much easier to visualize. In this molecule here, I've gotten rid of all of the carbon-hydrogen bonds, and I'm representing all of the carbons by angles here. So there's one implicit hydrogen here, one here. Oh, there's one here too, right? Because I need four bonds to carbon. There are zero hydrogens here, zero hydrogens here, three out here, and three out here. If I look at this second molecule here, I can actually draw it out, and it looks fairly simple, and I can sort of see how things are bonded fairly quickly here. And finally, down here at this third example, I see there's a triple bond easily, a double bond. I have a double bond oxygen, and I have an oxygen methyl group here. When I go back over here to the Lewis structure, things are just too congested to easily visualize them. So we spend a lot of time just looking at line angle formulas and these drawings because they're so easy to draw quickly and they're so easy to look at and visualize. So let's look at TNT, okay? or 246-trinitrotoluene. We'll draw the Lewis structure, we'll draw the resonance structure, and then we'll draw the line angle structure. So here's the Lewis structure, okay? And there's a lot going on here. If I draw out every single one of the atoms, all the hydrogens, all the carbons, if I draw the line angle structure and draw it as a resonance structure, it simplifies it a lot, okay? I see that instead of having all these charges, plus and minuses, and I have all these delocalized, hybridized uh, resonance structures here, I can just draw the dotted lines. It simplifies it a lot. But if I draw just the line angle structure here, I even simplify it more. Instead of drawing on all the oxygens and the sort of the hybridized, resonance structure here, I just put NO2 at each one. And for the CH3 group up here, I just draw a line. So it simplifies it a lot. I can look at this molecule and tell you it's trinitrotoluene very quickly compared to looking at this monstrosity over here with all these lines and lone pairs of electrons, etc. We also use wedges and dashes a lot to draw 3D perspective of molecules. And there's a little bit difference depending on what textbook you look at. So some textbooks, if I look at the bond between carbon and this hydrogen, it's a wedge which gets larger as you move toward the hydrogen. That implies that hydrogen's coming out of the board. If I look at this carbon to this hydrogen, it starts out as a large wedge and then funnels down into a small point there.
and that implies that it's going back into the board. Most test books, however, draw both of them with the larger part of the triangle, both the solid wedge and the dash wedge, big near the hydrogen. So this is a different convention that is used by most books compared to there. We also can look at this three-dimensional picture here and compare it to this ball and stick model, which gives me a really good three-dimensional view of where the atoms are, but it doesn't accurately depict where the electron clouds are. Where is this model here where I have the electron cloud shown here for each of the atoms is a very accurate predict description of ethane, but it's hard to see again. So that's why we have three different ways to represent three-dimensional structures. We tend to use this one over here with the lines and the wedges the most often. Okay. One thing about single bonds is that I can rotate freely about single sigma bonds. So notice here that I have the two methyl groups in the plane of the board. So in the plane, in the plane, in the plane, in the plane. I have these two hydrogens represented by wedge bonds coming out of the screen. And I have these two hydrogens going in. Remember that it's a tetrahedral structure over here. If I rotate about that single bond, I can interconvert and move the methyl group up. And that's free rotation at room temperature. Literally a very small barrier to rotation. So at room temperature, where we have a lot of energy just because of the heat at room temperature, this meth whole group over here is rotating freely about that single bond. Double bonds cannot rotate without significant amount of energy. In fact, to rotate about a double bond, I literally have to break that pi bond, the one shown here in the with the dumbbells here, and then reform it to interconvert this molecule into this molecule. And that takes a lot of energy because there's a point in here where there's no overlap. There's a broken the pi orbital. Now let's look at isomers. We have two different types of isomers that we talk about a lot in organic chemistry. Isomers are molecules that have the same molecular formula, meaning the same number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens, halogens, whatever atoms are in that molecule, but they're arranged differently. The two different types of isomers that we have are what we call constitutional isomers. Sometimes these are called structural isomers. They mean the same things, depending on which textbook you're looking at, but they have different connectivity. Notice in this molecule called 1-chloroethanol, the chlorine here is attached to the same carbon that the OH is attached to. If I compare that to 2-chloroethanol, my chlorine is now attached to a different carbon. Even though they have the same molecular formula, they actually are connected together. These are isomers of each other. Specifically, we're going to call them structural or constitutional isomers. The second type of isomer that we talk about in organic chemistry are stereoisomers. That's where they actually have the same molecular formula, but they also have the same connectivity, but they differ, on, differ only in the arrangement of the atoms in space, the three-dimensional nature. So I, if I look at the two stereoisomers of one fluoroethanol, I have a fluorine and a hydroxy group. So it's an alkyl halide and it's an alcohol. Notice here I have the hydroxyl group coming out of the board and the hydrogen going back into the board. These three atoms are all in the plane of the board. If I contrast that to the molecule at the left, I have the hydroxyl group going into the board and the hydrogen coming out of the board. These two are different molecules. They literally have different physical and chemical properties. We call these stereoisomers. Even though they have the same molecular formula, they have the same connectivity. This hydroxyl group is connected to this carbon. This hydroxyl group is connected to this carbon. They're disoriented in space differently. That's where these wedges become important so we can differentiate between the two stereoisomers. Let's look at a few constitutional isomers. So 
Molecules that have the same chemical formula but the atoms are connected in a different order are called constitutional isomers, and these have different physical properties. Okay? So if I look at n-pentane, all my carbons are organized in a linear fashion. I have 5 carbons and 12 hydrogens. There is a constitutional isomer of n-pentane where I have a branch here instead of being linear. So I have one, two, three, four carbons in a row and one is branched. I still have the same number of hydrogens. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. There are 12 hydrogens in here. These two are completely different molecules even though they have the same molecular formula. There's also a third constitutional isomer of n-pentane, where I have three carbons in a row, and I branch off in here to have this CH3 and this CH3 sticking off my central carbon here. That is called neopentane. This also has different physical properties from isopentane and n-pentane. If I look at stereoisomers, one other type of stereoisomers is when I have a double bond. I can have cis-trans stereoisomers of each other, where if I look at this molecule here, my two methyl groups are sticking on one side of my double bond. There is another molecule that exists out there where my methyl groups are on opposite sides of the double bond. We call this one cis-2-butene. We call this one trans-2-butene. These ones also have different physical and chemical properties from each other. There is a constitutional isomer of cis and trans-2-butene, where in this case, I have my double bond out here between carbon number one and carbon number two. I still have the same molecular formula as I do for these two molecules, but my bonding is different. I have a double bond between different carbons here. So one butene is a constitutional isomer of trans-2-butene, and it is a constitutional isomer of cis-2-butene. Let's now do a practice exercise where we look at hybridization and bond angles for each of the carbon atoms in the following molecule. So this molecule, methane, if I look straight at that carbon in the middle here, I know that it is bonded to four different hydrogen atoms, all being single bond. So those have to be sp3 hybridized bonds. Each one of those is an sp3. Each of them is going to be at 109.5 degrees. If I look at this second molecule over here, I know that this carbon out here at the end is also bound to four different atoms by single bonds. And so that has to be sp3 also. This carbon atom has two carbon atoms attached to it and two hydrogens, so it's going to be sp3. Well, here's a double bond, okay? I only have three atoms attached to that carbon. Here's one carbon, here's the second carbon, and there's an implicit hydrogen that I don't show here. So that has to be sp2 or 120 degree bond angles. And the same thing out here. There are two hydrogens out here that are not shown. If I look at this molecule, which is acetone, I have an sp3 hybridized carbon atom where all the bonds are at 109.5. I have a sp2 hybridized carbon atom because I have a double bond again. It's got to be sp2 hybridized, and that's at 120 degrees. And my third carbon over here, again, has three implicit hydrogens attached to it and one carbon attached to it, all single bonds. There are four of them, so there are four sp3 hybridized bonds to that carbon atom. If I look over here at this molecule, I now introduce nitrogen to it. Okay, So let's first look at the carbons here. Because there's a triple bond at that carbon, that has to be a sp hybridized molecular orbital bond there, and it's got to be at 180 degrees. This one here in the center is going to be an sp3 because I have four single bonds. This is another carbon with a triple bond, so it's sp triple bond SP. 
If I look at this molecule here, I notice that it is a cation, so it's an ionic species. Let's draw that in three dimensions to represent it a little more accurately. So I have three single bonds, but in this case I have an empty p orbital in here. So what that implies is that these are 120 degrees apart from each other. So even though I only have three atoms bound to that carbon, that's going to be sp2 hybridized, where these ones out here at the end are going to be sp3 hybridized. This one is a very important cation that we talk about significantly and comprehensively here in organic chemistry, and it is called a carbocation. Because it has this empty p orbital in it, it wants two more electrons. So it's a very reactive species, and there's a lot of chemical reactions that go through an intermediate carbocation species. And that's the end of chapter one. I'm now going to introduce next week chapter two material where we talk about acids and bases and then we review a bunch of functional groups.